The Leader of the National Party. It does seem a little odd to be rising after we've had the debate that we've had over the last couple of days, and uh, I will choose not to recover too much of the conversation we've had over the loan bill, but I would like to contribute uh, through the address and reply process and, uh, and offer my congratulations to the Deputy Speakers and the Acting Speaker. I've already offered my congratulations to the Speaker and uh, I wish, and wish you all well as you go about the business of this House. I'd also like to welcome the new members uh, to the House. Many of you are sitting here that are unfamiliar to me as yet. Um, and if I haven't been present for your inaugural speeches, I will be and are making my way through them uh, on Hansard, uh, because it is important to know and, uh, and get to know the people that you work with in these very close quarters. So congratulations. It is exciting, I hope, um, uh, and I'm sure that most have felt humbled as we've stood in this place. Um, as someone who has been a member of both houses and both chambers, I can offer the obs observation that we are all here to make a contribution despite the fact that we will not always all agree and, uh, and that we all come to this place hoping to leave our communities better and, uh, and to certainly improve things for them. And the theatre and the, the froth and the bubble of this chamber at times, particularly in question time, is probably not uh, and certainly not representative, I think, of some of the, uh, the work that you will do in your electorates, which is enormously, enormously uh, rewarding and uh, I'm sure that you will all look forward to doing that. I know a number of you have worked for members of parliament or in the process already and so we'll understand that it is uh, rewarding meeting with some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, taking up issues on their behalf and, uh, and sometimes bringing them to this chamber and debating them. Uh, and so I wish you all very well but I do, and, and I do believe that we all genuinely seek to enhance and improve this great state. Congratulations to the Premier and, uh, and the Ministers and the Cabinet. It's the first opportunity I've had to say that. And uh, you, uh, you have won resoundingly and, uh, and I expect that you will continue to remind us all of that. Um, I would expect you to do that um, and this achievement. Um, and <laughs> I'm not sure that we need the reminder, given that when we walk into this chamber, I, we are surrounded on this side uh, by your members, uh, so we have a daily reminder walking into the chamber. I, I, would, though, I would, though, offer some caution, because, uh, and particularly in the light of the Premier's comments that because of the majority Labor has returned, it gives them a mandate to do whatever they please and that we should just allow it to happen. And I think this was more directed to the Legislative Council, given that that's somewhat uh, slightly different numbers in that chamber than it is in this chamber. But that certainly won't be happening from our perspective. So whilst we respect the fact that you have won resoundingly and there are many members sitting in this chamber and whilst we can find ourselves sitting on that side when we divide with only four of our members or the few that are sitting on this side, which is a little demoralising, I'm not going to lie, um, we will still be aiming to hold you to account. That is our job and, uh, and we will be doing that. Uh, it is certainly not a mandate to do whatever you like without the scrutiny that should be applied. And the Premier and, and his ministers must absolutely uh, make good on their commitment to deliver for all Western Australians, all Western Australians, not just the ones that voted for them. And, uh, and I do, I just, I'm just recalling some of the answers that we've had in question time already to date, where particularly the Minister for Transport was talking today about Metronet, and clearly that was a centrepiece of the, uh, of the government's uh, election platform. And as regional members, we are naturally concerned that a, a vast majority of what the, uh, this new government is committed to is a spend in the metropolitan area. And I just do remind the Minister for Transport and all the other ministers that are making decisions on a daily basis that there are projects in regional Western Australia that need their attention. And uh, in particular to the Minister for Transport, I have uh, and the member for Moore has a, uh, a rail line of our own uh, and a train of our own that we fought very hard for, the Avonlink. And, uh, and I feel that its demise is near because of this change of government. And so whilst there's this money being spent uh, on Metronet and looking after the suburbs and the, and the good people of the Perth metropolitan area, I do implore uh, this new government to make sure that we don't let uh, this particular service go because there are people in my electorate, the member for Moore's electorate, that value this service greatly and we don't think that we deserve it any less than the people in the suburbs and, and the, the members that have stood up and spoken so highly of, the, uh, of this project of, of Metronet. So we are here to govern, or you are here to govern for all. 
um, despite this enormous majority, especially those that have not voted for you. And, uh, and it will be our task, um, the Nationals, to make sure that you don't forget, as has happened in the past, that there are people in regional WA that need our support. It is hard to deliver services and, uh, and to make sure that there is investment in regional Western Australia. Regional development is difficult. And I know there are members in this House that and understand that. You, uh, you need to make a concerted effort. There must be a plan. Um, it is more expensive to deliver these services. It is harder to attract and retain people. And certainly we saw vast improvement in both of those things over the last eight years. But there was always more to do. And it was very hard to turn that ship around in the eight years that we had. Uh, but certainly I feel the mood in regional Western Australia shifted when they saw this state government, uh, the, the Liberal National Government, uh, make a commitment to the people of regional WA, that they were there for the long haul, that there was a fund that was going to allow them to aspire to deliver projects that they had long since put in the bottom drawer and forgotten about. Because I tell you what, that's what they felt like. When we'd come to government in 2008, that's what they felt like, that none of their aspirations could ever be met. They didn't even dare to think that they might be able to put a project on the table, take something into one of their regional development commissions, approach a member of the government, because it simply wasn't on the agenda of the previous Labor government. They were in utter despair. And there were many, many black holes in regional WA. They'd just been left, left to rot. And so we accept, as I said, that we lost. We've lost, and it is now your task to take that up on the people of everyone, on, on every person's behalf in, in Western Australia. But please, we implore. And we will be making sure that, uh, that you don't forget that regional Western Australia is the engine room of this, uh, this state and its great economy. Uh, the fact that we lost, and we are sitting on this side of the House, um, is, a, is a hard transition. Uh, it is a hard transition. But that said, the heads in the, uh, in the Parliamentary National Party, I think, can be held high. And we do. We hold them high. Our small uh, but mighty party has been around for 100 years, and I am confident we will be around for another 100 years. And we bucked the trend of the wave of change that washed over Western Australia at this last election. Uh, there was undoubtedly a tidal wave of support for the Labor Party. Uh, in, and when I say that we bucked the trend, I go to the numbers, um, Mr Acting Speaker. In 2013, 71,694 people cast a vote for the National Party in the electorates that we, that we, we ran in. In 2017, and we typically run in every regional seat, 71,313 people cast a vote for the National Party. So in the biggest swing to the Labor Party ever seen in this state, the Nationals just lost just 381 votes. Of course, there were shifts across those electorates, um, and we have, uh, we have lost members of parliament, some incredibly important members of parliament. But in terms of the raw numbers, in terms of that raw vote, that support for the Nationals, uh, our team can hold its head high. We did our bit, and, uh, and we are in a, a very strong position to make sure that we are there holding this government to account. In the Legislative Council between 2013 and 2017, just 28 votes shy of what we achieved in 2013. So uh, biggest, biggest shift against uh, a government in, uh, in the history, biggest swing towards the Labor Party, and congratulations to you, but the National Party have held their own. Uh, but there were some losses and there were some shifts in where those voters were. Uh, and so I do want to take, just at this point in time before we move on any further, uh, the fact that we had a very strong campaign team um, and the work that was done by our members of parliament, our candidates, the organisation, uh, our volunteers and supporters was exceptional. And I want that on record because uh, we are a small party, we are a small team, we don't have unions, we don't have big business and we certainly had sections of big business fighting against us with uh, a campaign the likes of which we've never seen in the history of uh, a campaigning in Western Australia. And so I would like to put on record to Jackie Boydell, our campaign director, Martin Aldridge, Nathan Quigley, our campaign central team, an enormous thank you on behalf of uh, the National Party for making sure that we are, we are still here, that uh, the National Party is still here to fight another day. And uh, from a very personal perspective, uh, while I'm on my feet, I would like to thank my local campaign team of Rob Tonetti, Theresa Midas, Heather Giles, Amy McAllister, uh, and our central Wheatbelt campaign team, which was far vaster than that. 
but they put in the hard yards uh, to make sure that uh, the central wheat belt remained in the hands of the National Party, and they did a magnificent job. The only last personal thanks I'd like to say, uh, because this is the first opportunity I've had while I'm on my feet, is that, uh, and the ministers will know uh, that are here this evening, that your ministerial team is absolutely invaluable. They've become an enormous support, somebody that you probably spend more time with than your own family at times. And uh, so I put on record my thanks to Doug Cunningham, Nicole O'Keefe, Jill Sounis, Josh Nyman, Amy McAllister, uh, the team that we had in that ministerial office uh, while I had the privilege of being a Minister of the Crown in the previous government were exceptional. They had served uh, over numerous governments, some of them, and, uh, and I couldn't have done it without them. So that was part of a broader team of uh, the, the Nationals going into the election. And like I've observed, we are now sitting on this side, but there was an enormous amount of effort put in to deliver us here. And uh, it is right to acknowledge the people that work behind the scenes to support us in these roles. Uh, I can't go further without mentioning the fact that we did, uh, we lost two members that recontested their seats. The Honourable Dave Grills, uh, member for the Mining and Pastoral Region, made a magnificent speech in uh, the Legislative Council for his um, a valedictory. Uh, Dave is an authentic individual who uh, was passionate about the communities of the Mining and Pastoral Region. Um, he is uh, one of those grassroots campaigners who loves nothing better to have been out in, uh, in his community doing the best uh, that he could. Um, devastated to lose him. I know that he will go on to do good things and we will see him walking the halls of Parliament House, advocating on behalf of the issues that he was uh, very passionate about. The other is, of course, Brendan Grills, and we've already touched on this in this House. Um, and I have to say that the departure of Brendan Grills as the member for Pilbara, previous leader of the party, it only strengthens our resolve to continue the pursuit of the policy and the change that will deliver for our constituents, those that live and work and invest in regional WA. His passion for regional WA has left an indelible mark on the communities that we seek to represent. And his leadership and his approach to public office has meant the people of regional WA now know what it's like to matter. And I know they will not forget. They will not forget. They will not forget what it's like to have the attention of government and the light of government shone on them because he had courage to bring that to the table. I pla I place members <laughs> members please he hasn't died I will take that interjection of course he hasn't died but this individual Brennan was an exceptional member of Parliament and contributed and contributed to the communities that we care about and if you ever ever took the time to visit regional communities you will know that you will get that feedback. Well, you'd get that feedback. Uh, you choose to ignore it. But you weren't in the House, member. You weren't in the House. I've acknowledged. We lost. I am now speaking about a previous leader of the National Party and someone that has served in this parliament for 16 years. Show some respect. I place on record my thanks to Brendan for his service, not only to the electorates he represented, which was Meriden, Central Wheatbelt and Pilbara, but for all Western Australians. He had an exceptional talent for tackling intractable issues, for inspiring people to get involved and for challenging the status quo. And it was a privilege to serve as his deputy, to serve in Cabinet and to be his successor in the electorate that he represented in Central Wheatbelt. And so on behalf of our parliamentary team and the Nationals, we do thank him and I put on record uh, we thank him for his service and his willingness to risk his own political career for something that we all believed in, because we all believed in it. We all went to the election with that belief. Deputy Leader. I'm sitting right beside the member who's delivering her speech, and I can't hear her because of the chatter from the other side of the room. I do, concur. I do ask members to please be silent while the Leader of the National Party gives her address. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Political... <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Political courage is, is rare in modern politics. And uh, it's easier to be beige, it's easier to avoid conflict, it's easier to fly under the radar, it's easier to be a small target. And uh, I think the cynics will say that, uh, that, that royalties for regions and, and the policy that we took to the election, they may feel that that's populist. But I tell you what, 
The people that live in our communities in regional Western Australia certainly did not think that. And, uh, and these policies were more than populism. They have, in particular, royalties for regions, fundamentally changed our state for the better. And, uh, and as we have prosecuted in this place, we still fundamentally believe that we need a new revenue uh, stream to stabilise our state's finances. So I think we lost a champion of regional WA, whether you believe in his politics or not. Uh, he was an exceptional contributor. And I'm sure those that have served with Brendan since 2001 would agree with that. Um, he was unable to provide a valedictory, um, obviously. And I'm sure that if he had had this opportunity, he would say to all the MPs in this chamber that you, be, you should be fearless in your pursuit of the things that matter to your constituents. And I would also think that he would say thank you to his family and his staff and the people he had the privilege of representing. So I say to Brendan and Susan and Thomas and Oliver and Jack, we wish you all the best. Um, to Susan and the kids, thank you very much for sharing your husband and your dad with the Nationals for 16 years because it has been a privilege to serve with him and uh, I'm sure that it will not be the last that we see of him. So Mr Speaker, I want to speak just briefly about the, uh, the, time, the period between 2008 and 2017 where the government put regional development firmly on the agenda. So it wasn't just a token effort. When we'd come to government, there'd been, there had, we're not denying that there'd been expenditure in regional WA, but it wasn't coordinated, it wasn't um, concerted. It was a, we've turned up to your community and we've given you a new school. We've turned up to your community and here's a new hospital. We've turned up to your community and here have an ambulance sub-centre. But no cohesive structure. And we often observed uh, prior to 2008 that whilst we plan every inch of our Perth metropolitan region, there was little structure to the future and, and the investment strategy for regional communities. It was lacking. And then that meant that it was left to the whims of the political cycle, the people that were in the positions of power, and, and also lent itself to the neglect that they ultimately experienced. And so Royalties for Regions gave us, for the first time, a dedicated revenue stream, because prior to that, uh, there was a regional development fund. Uh, Mr Speaker, may I have an extension of time, please? Extension Mr. granted. Acting Speaker, sorry. Um, but it was $80 million in the uh, Gallup Carpenter government over four years, and it was all pre-allocated. really hadn't been any discussion uh, at a local level with any of the, uh, the people that it was being delivered to, so there was no grassroots um, involvement in decision making and that was something that we came to change and so we came to government off the back of a very city centric uh, Labor government that neglected the regions and I think what we've done and I believe very I, I do believe this that we've given them a blueprint and a map and again the desire to list, lift their aspiration for what they can achieve it is right that they can uh, they can aspire to have projects that have only ever been talked about for the Perth metropolitan area. It shouldn't matter that you live hundreds of kilometres away from the Perth, uh, the Perth CBD. Um, we're not saying that we need a tertiary hospital in every single one of our communities. We don't, we don't think that's the case. We do think, though, that we should have access to decent healthcare, and there are creative ways of coming to meet this need but it's hard. You actually have to work at it and you have to think outside the square. So the traditional models of service delivery don't work. They don't work. And we find that with the funding mechanisms that come from the federal government as well in relation to aged care, health care. It doesn't work. Particularly in my area, I have to speak from the central wheat belt's perspective, childcare is broken in the central wheat belt. It is not sustainable. The model they use to fund childcare doesn't work. We used royalties for regions to try and see if we could come up with a different way of delivering sustainable childcare services because the mums and the dads and the families in regional Western Australia have the same expectations as everyone else. But it is very hard in some of these smaller communities to make the models of you know, 80 kids, 90 kids or more work. It doesn't. And so you have to be creative, but you have to have the will to be creative because it's really easy. It's really easy to ignore it because there's not as many people out there as there are sitting on the doorstep of this place here in the Perth metropolitan area. And the same with aged care. Federal, federal government model of, uh, of funding is 80, 80 beds or more, I think, for a, a, uh, an aged care facility. Well, the people of Calabaran, the people of Meriden, I've only got the biggest town in my electorate, 7,500 people. We're not going to have an 80-bed high-end dementia care unit. 
Uh, so you have to be creative. Royalties for Regions gave us the opportunity to go to the federal government, to go to the state departments and say, how would you solve this? How would you solve this for our communities? Be creative. We worked with the public service, uh, the people that were willing to think outside the square, to deliver the Southern Inland Health Initiative, to deliver the, uh, the childcare services, to think about how we might buck the trend of uh, aged members of our community, our seniors, the ones that built the towns, being able to stay in the towns that they built with their family and their friends at a time when they need them the most. We did that. We did that and royalties for regions allowed us to do that. And so that is why we are so fearful that the commentary that we've seen from the government to this point is that that's all about to stop. That it's about to stop. Because they're either trying to find savings or they're going to cut it. We haven't been able to get a clear answer from the minister. We certainly haven't been able to get a clear answer from the Premier or the Treasurer. And so we are nervous and our communities are nervous. Uh, we know that, there, that every project within regional uh, royalties for regions that hasn't had a signed FAA, even some that have, have been called back in to be put on the minister's office desk uh, for them to scour through. So people that have... Uh, line by line. Absolutely. And we've also heard the commentary that, uh, you know, if you haven't... If you... Uh, who was telling me this the other day? If you, haven't, if you haven't started your project, if there's not a stake in the ground, then pretty much just write it off. These are people that have done... We've done the project work, they've got the business case, they've uh, met the threshold of it going through Cabinet. The member for Moore pointed this out. It was the Cabinet of the day. It was approved. These community groups... These community groups uh, had been working, and in many cases, groups of local governments in our communities, particularly on aged care projects, uh, have been working away, trying to find a solution for their communities. And we fear that that is now all to be lost, all to be lost, because they'll either be substituted for promises that were made by the uh, the incoming government, which is their is their right, or completely just just cut, just cut. And that's unacceptable to us. And some clarity would be good, because everything's ground to a halt. It's ground to a halt and people are nervous, they're confused, they don't know what the future of the regional development commissions are going to be. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very poor signal to be sending to the people that, are, that have been working so hard. Uh, they are feeling let down. So we know that they are not safe, not one of these contracts is safe. I think another sign that this, uh, this government has uh, put on the table, um, and I spoke about it briefly the other day, is, is that there was an announcement made by the Minister of Transport um, around the, uh, the $89 million contribution out of a possible $2.3 billion federal, state road and rail package. Um, and that was claimed as a, a win for regional WA. That was the quote in the media statement from the Minister for Transport, that two projects that equate to 89 million out of 2.3 billion uh, was a win for regional WA. It's like the crumbs off the edge of the table. Thanks very much. One of them's a project, just, it's, a, it's planning money. It's not even an actual project to this point. Uh, and so, again, it's a signal that's being sent to regional communities that, well, we'll give you a little bit, but don't expect too much more. You've had your fair share already. You've had your fair share. You don't get any more. And that is, that is less than 4 per cent of that total package which they've crowed about in, uh, in question time and in this parliament and uh, in, in the public. It's 4 per cent. 4 per cent. I'm not sure that anyone in my community would think that that is a win. Uh, certainly they would be very nervous to think that that's what would be considered a win uh, under this new government's attitude towards spending. So that coupled with the fact that more than half of the uh, election commitments made by the incoming government were on Metronet, uh, means that there are all sorts of signals going uh, out to our communities that, that give them cause to be nervous. And we then are equally nervous. We are nervous that we don't get answers to questions. We are nervous that there won't be any further project funding, that we've had our fair share, that's it, no more, see you later. And so every moment we feel uh, from, from the answers we're getting from ministers and, and the Premier and the Treasurer is, is to be consumed by these uh, or focused on the Perth metropolitan area and it's like the good old days of pre-2008 when we came to government um, and the playbook is not too much different. And I do wonder how in all good consciousness the, uh, the members for Bunbury and Kimberley and Pilbara and Collie and Albany can sit in the House and, and support 
an agenda like this, when they'll have to go back to their own communities and have this debate with their communities, um, it will be difficult. And we talked about that from the, the, the perspective of a, a broader economic um, debate about why, how, how are all members of the government going to back, go back to their communities, having said no increases to taxes, no increases to fees and charges. Um, you know, we've got regional members that are now going to have to stand shoulder to shoulder with their comrades and, and defend enormous expenditure in the metro area and very limited uh, anywhere else in the state. So that will be a challenge. That will be a challenge. And like I said, the expectations of regional Western Australians have been, have been raised over the last eight years. There is a very high bar that has been set. And people know what they deserve in our communities. Uh, they have seen what it is like to have a government care and they will not tolerate, they will not tolerate being ignored. Now, Mr Speaker, I don't particularly... Sorry, Mr <laughs> Acting Speaker. That's fine. I, uh, I don't uh, want to go over too, for too long the fact uh, that it's been canvassed well over the last day in relation to the loan bill and the fact that this side of the House believes that there needs to be a new revenue stream and that we don't think that uh, the, uh, the, the government is exploring all opportunities, although it did seem that in a consideration in detail of the loan bill that despite the fact that the Premier and the Treasurer previously had said, no, we're not interested in talking to either of the companies, that there is some work being done. Um, they are looking at uh, some of the, uh, the state agreements and having a conversation with uh, some of these uh, companies. And they absolutely should, because they cannot go back to the communities that they represent and realistically say to them that we are going to do what we said we wouldn't before the election. They said they wouldn't. Ask for another $11 billion and then not ask for every sector of the community to, to, to do their fair share of the, the heavy lifting. So it is the ultimate irony. We've seen today that there's been uh, rallies by the CPSU, and I've read enough of the, the new speeches from the incoming members to know that there are strong union links right through this house, right through this house. And so they will come calling, I'm sure. And there are rolling meetings in relation to that, and I can't remember what they said. Something to do with a machete. A machete. Where have I got it? What did I do with it, Shane? Here we go. You lost us at machete. No machete, real bargaining, job security. Premier, keep your promises. Two weeks into the parliamentary sitting and the CPSU, although they weren't brave enough to come to the steps of Parliament House, which they had no hesitation in doing when we were in government and, uh, and talked about uh, increased wages or, or frozen uh, wages um, and negotiating. So they're, they're keeping their distance. They're having a little bit of a go. They're having a little bit of a go, but they're not putting too much pressure on yet. But I think that will change. What's that? Maybe there are too many of them to fit in the book. Oh, maybe, maybe. Well, they're having them just sort of dotted around the city, as far as I can tell. So um, that, that is an interesting development. Um, and you would think that that will increase over the, over the period of time when those, uh, those job losses start to be realised. They'll start to be realised. And the Premier again today couldn't confirm uh, what percentage or whether there would be uh, an equal spread between regional and metropolitan, like in terms of where we're going to be more hard hit in regional Western Australia. And we know that's normally the case, again, because it's more expensive to employ people, to attract people, to retain people in country communities. But we made that commitment. Uh, I'm not sure that this government is up to that. And that will be the challenge. That will be the challenge because the unions will start to get restless and they will bring that argument, hopefully a little bit closer to the House next time. Mm. Don't stay down in the Perth Central District. Bring it to the Parliament steps like you did when we were in government. Put a little bit of pressure and stand up for your members. So I think um, I don't, as I said, we've, we've canvassed the fact that um, the Nationals still believe that there is a, a, an opportunity for this government to pursue additional revenue. It's been canvassed today in this House. That, uh, that we need to make sure uh, that we understand the context in which spending decisions were made by the previous government and that there were some headwinds. Uh, and that you cannot get yourself out of a structural de deficit by saving and saving and cutting and cutting. It's not going to work. You need a new revenue stream. You need the GST. That GST is over the horizon. It's not, it's not coming in any, any time soon. And so there is an opportunity for this government uh, to sit down seriously and look at a revenue source that isn't going to impact mums and dads and pensioners on fixed incomes, small businesses, and make sure that they aren't being asked to do the heavy lifting when it would appear that there is no appetite to, uh, to compel the two biggest mining companies that we assisted and facilitated to grow. 
and deliver enormous profits on a non-renewable resource that own, is owned by the people of Western Australia. Uh, we would expect that this government is doing everything in their, uh, in their power to make sure that that burden is not left to the most vulnerable in our community. So thank you uh, for... Uh, I, I really don't want to go over it again because I feel like we've done it ad nauseum over the last day. I think people are very clear on the position that the Nationals have brought. Um, and, I, and once again, thank uh, the National Party and the, the, uh, the team that we have here. I think we can hold our heads high off the back of the election. And, uh, and we will certainly be seeking to hold this government to account over the next four years. Thank you. The member for Geraldton.